Okay. So it's like right here, camera. <laughs> I am not sure what to doing, but okay. It's weird. Okay, so why is this one up? We need to delete this. Let's hope this one works better. Let's hope we're steady on this. Okay. I have to I had to do it a different way. And now for some reason my camera follows me. I think it's gonna work. I think we are in a good place. Oh come on. I don't know what's wrong. So far, we are shaking and baking. We are shaking and baking this morning. It took four times, four times to make this work. I don't know. I get it. I need my own studio with all my stuff set up so this nonsense can stop. So, anyhow. And right now, it looks like it's working and... My camera seems to be moving on its own. So I'm not sure why we're so close up today. <laughs> whoa, 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 settle down. Why are we so close? One second. I don't know what is going on here. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see if I can figure this out because I'm not sure why this camera is all in. Here we go. Well, I'm glad that the uh, camera just showed me a new feature on how it can follow me. <laughs> so that's that's pretty good. But yeah, that thing was in my face. Anyway, lesson nine, lesson nine. We are on lesson nine. And so I don't know what happened here. If we're good, Make sure you let me know we're good because I don't know. I am not seeing anything. I am just seeing my phone. So hopefully everything is in order and it's working and we have no more interruptions. So we are in lesson nine. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time with you, that we can be with you, that we can be one with you, God. We just thank you, God. And we, uh, we're just honored to be able to come into your presence. Your presence is saturating it. It's, it surrounds us. It's it's in us. It's with us. It's for us. Lord, you're just so faithfully good. And Lord, we just want to thank you for giving us this privilege in life in Jesus' name. So we're doing lesson nine. And so far, it looks like we're steady. And so we're going to take advantage of this moment that we're not breaking up. And we're moving on. So lesson nine. Lesson nine. Uh, in the last four sets of um, takes, because <laughs> I've been doing this four times. So the last four times, um, I was saying that people were saying people would generally say, "Oh, don't be so heavenly minded minded that you're no earthly good," which is a lie. You can be heavenly minded and still be earthly good because heaven's mind is on earth. It's it's thinking about its people on earth. And so therefore, we need that wisdom when we are thinking about how to proceed in life here on earth moving forward. So let's just debunk that right now. OK, so. Lesson nine, probably the number one symptoms of a spirit of poverty is, guess what? Can anybody guess? I wish I had a drum roll. Lack of generosity. The lack of generosity. One of the symptoms that reveal that you are connected to the spirit of poverty is the lack of giving. If it's hard for you to give with pleasure, that you may have the spirit of poverty. It will not go well with your finances. Stinginess is an inner attitude. Stinginess is an inner 
attitude. Somebody type that in. Stinginess is an inner attitude. It is an attitude that comes from within. We talked a little bit yesterday about the soul. Where would you think stinginess will come from? The place of your soul. Because that's where your mind, will, and emotions sit. So the place of your soul has an attitude and it's saying, I'm stingy and I don't like giving. And so when I begin <clears throat> to want to give, it's coming out of a place of stinginess and not a place of, I love giving. I love blessing people. I love giving gifts. I like seeing people's faces when, when I surprise them with something. So <clears throat> that's just me. Like, I always like going to places and, and I'll see something and I'll think of someone. And I'll say, oh, this person would love this. Like, I went to um, down here. I feel like my hat's crooked. I went down here. We have a place called um, Ross. And I saw this amazing idea for like... A gift and I was thinking oh you know they're planning to have a church um, you know secret Santa and I thought not about buying one but I thought about buying all three because I want to bless three people and so <clears throat> you know that's not that I, I, it's not a place of stinginess It's a place from where I'm really coming out of a, of, of a place of love and so I think about how this person would love this and it would be such a blessing to them just because um, they weren't expecting it. And maybe you'd be surprised that when you give somebody a gift, it's out of a place that they desired and the Lord knew their desire and he calls for someone else to bring forth this desire for this person to be fulfilled. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a little, little like testimony, so to say. So one day I went to um, Walmart. I don't know if the camera is the hat, but it's annoying me. I went to Walmart and I wanted to get one of those water bottles where you can put the fruit things in it. And now I went to Walmart and I'm saying to myself, um, I want to get this little bottle with the fruit in it because that's like one of my things, like water with the fruit. And I went there and it was like, it was like $15. And I, I I am not working. I do this full time. And so I get, I go to, I pass to the church and I get whatever they, you know, give a stippling for, but this is right now, this is my income. This is what I do. And so I, at that moment was like, and this is before, like we were in a, in a situation and I was like, uh, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that I shouldn't spend $15 on this when I can wait. I'll wait until I can get it where it's not, you know, sacrificial, where I'm not sacrificing $15 of my money that I really can't spend on something. I'm just going to have to put my fruit inside my water for now. And so the Lord heard and I was there by myself and I was like, you know, and I wanted the pretty one. Like I wanted the you know, I'm, I'm, I like colors. I like designs. And so I wanted the, the beautiful one. And so the next day we were staying at one of our uh, pastor that we know in their home. And she says to me, Oh, tomorrow we have one of those, um, one of those rallies and, you know, we just walk around and that's what they were going to do our job. She works for the city. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. Well, she came and she says, Iris, I have something for you. And I'm like, really? She was like, yeah, I don't know why, but I, I, they gave me this and I knew it was for you. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, ooh, like what, what, what is it? You know, cause I, I like surprises. And so I go and she hands me this cup that puts the fruit thing in it. And it was something that they were giving out in the city. And I'm just like, now it wasn't the, it wasn't the pattern it, that I wanted. It wasn't like the extravagant look. But when she gave it to me, I was like, wow, like, really, God, like, you know, my little tiniest desire and you fulfill it. It wasn't the, it wasn't like I looked at it and was like, oh, you know, oh, my God, it's not what I wanted. But OK, no, I was like, I was like struck by the fact that 
you cared enough to know that I really wanted that and you gave me that. And so that is God. That is the Lord, our God. You know, like the tiniest thing, as, as stupid as it might seem, like just a cup that holds my fruit water in it, I'm just like, wow. I, 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 I got to tell you that I had to go, I had to retreat, you know? Retreat means like I had to find a place for myself and just sit and, and think to, you know, just think and be with God and say, wow, you, you know, my tiniest little desire and you fulfilled it, even though it's not exactly what I wanted, but you send it forth. And I rem it just revealed to me how he longs to give us good gifts. He longs to give us good gifts. And yeah, I, he could give me the the one I really wanted and, and surprise me with that. But at that moment, it was a speed of recovery and it came the next day and it came in a form of, of, of just receiving. So someone received it, knew it was for me and gave it to me. It was so amazing, but he really does. It was just a moment of gratitude that I had um, just for him just doing that, just a simple little thing. So... Stinginess is the inner attitude and a literal spirit that can attach to something that is opposing the nature of God. It is opposite of who God is. It is opposite of his character, of his way. It is just the opposite. And so God loves to give. He, uh, he honestly really does. And he is constantly giving to those who are not even deserving of it. That's, that's even the more kind of like a heartbreaking moment because we don't deserve it. You know, there's times that our thoughts are not his thoughts and we're thinking things that we shouldn't be thinking or we're saying things that we shouldn't be saying. And, and yes, the Holy Spirit will say, you know, have self-control, control yourself, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we're not deserving. And here we are receiving a love that we don't deserve and that's who he is this is the reason you cannot fix someone who has a spirit of poverty by giving money it will not work this is the reason you cannot fix someone who has a spirit of poverty by giving money it just will not work okay let's talk about this before we get into scripture. Spirit of poverty. Hey, Lisa. Thank you for coming back. Um, <clears throat> the spirit of poverty will leave someone broke all the time. It will leave someone in devastation and lack, not knowing where their money is going. Every time they put their money in their pocket, it's gone. It comes to devour. Then what happens is they need. So the people around them begin to give because they're givers and they're not stingy and they give. But it doesn't matter how much you give. This person can never come out of it until they have broken the curse of the poverty. Okay. And that's a mindset thing. I am such a firm believer in teaching people about finances. I am firm. I believe that the church should be teaching people about finances. Unless you were born in a house that their family, your family was like to the T about finances, you know, accounting, like they, they've had spreadsheets about what they, they spend and always, you know, <clears throat> being wise and stewarding the money, being good givers and doing all of that. Unless you were born and raised in a house like that, then I, I can assume that you have a hard time with your finances, juggling, managing, trying to figure it out. So teaching our people about finances and how to stay out of the it's enslavement of debt because the Bible says we are to be a debt in debt to nobody, no one. Why? Because it enslaves you to that debt. Okay. 
uh, if you own a car and you're making p- car payments on it, you better believe you missed that payment. The debtor, your slave master, will be calling you and asking you for that money. If not, they'll come and take it away. This is why God does not like that because what he gives, he gives for you to have permanently, not temporarily. So what is wisdom? Wisdom on this is say, save up your money. Save up till you have enough to buy the car in cash. For example, uh, if the car costs 5,000, you can get a really good car for $5,000. You're just gonna have to sacrifice until you get $5,000 saved up to buy a car in cash. What if you don't have that opportunity to do that? Then you better make sure that you're a good steward and you start paying that car down as quickly as possible. That means if you can give a little extra to your car payment every month, give a little extra. Don't eat out. Take that money and send it to your car payment. Don't put it towards your principal. This is what I'm talking about when I say finances need to be in order. Um, you should always have a savings. You should always have a savings. Why? Because things happen. We have to have at least $1,000 in our savings account, at least, and be able to put it back if you touch it. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you don't take the savings and never replace it. Your savings account should always be at $1,000, at least your minimum, at least your minimum, because things happen. Car breaks down, tires go bald, tune-ups are, you know, all these things that you can't afford at that moment when it happens, you have to have that money and save. So I am a firm believer in knowing how to do finances. And that's, to be honest with you, I never knew that that was like one of my niches. You see what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know that was a niche for me. It's a niche for me. It is a niche for me. And I have had visions where I've seen myself uh, pros- like like coming into that realm and helping people break open. But because I've helped them break open, I myself was prospering from helping them prosper. You see how this works? It's a ripple effect. So if I help you break out from your poverty, you're helping me break out or stay out of poverty. That's how finances work. So, um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm a firm believer that I feel like even this year with the pandemic and all that happening, people have misspent their money. Maybe they didn't have any money and now they're like in massive amount of debt and they need help getting out. They don't know how. And I think that this is going to be the perfect time to start teaching our people how. So scripture, let's examine Proverbs eleven twenty five. Proverbs eleven twenty five. Proverbs eleven twenty five says, "The generous soul will be rich, and he who waters will be watered also himself." Let's go up to number four. Because they seem 24 and 25 are connected. There is one who scatters and yet increases. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Do you hear? That's the stingy part right there. There is one who says, here's a little bit for everyone. And then there's that one that says, I can only give this knowing you can give more, but you don't give. So therefore you got the hole in your pocket. Then it says, generous is the soul. So the generous soul will be rich. And he who waters will be watered himself. Ah, I love that. Let me give you an explanation. God promises that those who are generous will receive back more than they give. Then it says, he blesses those who are kind and generous, whether it be with money, with things, with abilities, with time, with acts of compassion. 
The New Testament teaches that we are stewards, we are caretakers, we are managers of God's gift and must use them to promote his cause to benefit those in need. Of course, the greatest need people have is to hear and receive Christ's message of forgiveness and a new life. We should be willing to give to ministry and mission efforts that are aimed at spreading this message to others in, in our own communities and around the world. You Do you know that missionaries do not um, make any money? They don't have any money. They live off of support of other people. And thank God for those people who support missionaries. But at the same time, I feel like a person who has given up everything in their life, who has gone to raise their family up in a jungle somewhere so that they can receive the message of Christ, deserves more than what they receive. They deserve more than what they receive. And we don't think like that. We think about spending our last pennies, you know, at Walmart or at Ross or at TJ Maxx without even having a self-conscious mind that says there's a family out there in the jungle that can use these $20. And, you know, I'm not saying that you can't do those things. What I'm saying is that don't overdo them. Don't don't be obsessive with letting the spirit of poverty destroy your finances. Be smart. Why are you in Walmart? Is it a necessity? Is it something you need or is it a want? Or you're just, you know, misspending your money. So it's time to get your priorities in line. What is, what is my priority? What do I need to put in order in my life? If I don't have enough to give, where am I, where can I stop spending to be a giver? So that's, that's a great, great scripture. It's great scripture for this. I love it. Okay. Now let's go to, um, let's go to Luke chapter six. We're going to go to Luke chapter 6, and we're going to go to verse 38. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you're looking for Luke, for those who are not familiar with their Bible yet. Luke 6, 38. In verse 38, it says, oh, I love this. Look at this. Let's see if you can see it. It's underlined already. That means I've been there before. <laughs> I love that. That means I've read this. God had God captured me already with this. Give, and it will be given to you. Look at this. How would it be given to you? It would be given to you good measure. It will be pressed down. It will be shaken together. It will be running over. Will men give unto you for with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. I love that. Give. And God says, and I'll give a good measure. I'll press it down. I'll shake it together. I'll run it over. <laughs> I love that. Because that's our father. That's a good father. Let's talk a little bit about this give. In keeping with the principle of love for others, we must give to those in need. Okay, God himself will measure our giving and in return will give back to us, though God's blessing will not always be evident, but visible material gain. Our rewards from him will be in portion to our active concern, generosity and help to others. The illustration of pouring into the lap probably refers to the way an outer garment was worn, leaving a large fold over the belt that would that could be used as a large pocket to hold an amount of grain for more on the topic of giving. So he's saying it's like taking a shirt and doing this. So that's what's going to happen because there's going to be an abundance of overflow and you need to catch it. You need to catch it. So that's how giving, being a giver, not out of a place of stinginess, out of a place of loving to give and being okay with that, knowing that God has your back. And if you're doing it out of a place like that, then you're going to be overflowing, catching the blessings of God so that you can bless and continue to be a blesser. 
So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sporadically will reap sporadically, but he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Let every man give according to the purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of unnecessary, for God loves a cheerful giver. You want to know why sometimes people give and they don't receive anything back? It's because their giving was out of a place of stinginess. They really didn't want to give. They become like uh, what people say, dinosaurs, when you ask them to give and they're like, Ugh. that's not, don't give. If, if your heart gets into a place like that, where it's like, eh, 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 then don't give because you're not going to reap anything. You're not going to get a dime of a blessing. Okay, you might as well just put your hands back in your pocket and get your heart right, because there's no way God is going to honor that disgusting moment in your heart. The Bible says God doesn't look at the exterior of our lives. He looks at the interior. He is looking at my heart and he is saying and judging according to my heart, not according to my outside action. He's looking inside and he's saying, um, Mm -mm. I won't honor that because it's against me. So if you want to, if you want to take your seeds and you want to take your seeds, let's say I have some seeds, which I do somewhere. That's what I was looking for. And I'm going to do this little here, little there, little here, little there. Guess how you're going to, how you're going to get it. You're going to get it back just like that. You're going to get it back just like that. A little blessing here, a little blessing there. That's how you're going to get it. But if you take your your seeds, okay? And, and listen, people have said, let me tell you something. Here's another thing people say. Make sure you're sowing in good ground. I have sown into bad ground. I have sown into bad ground. But God still honored it. I'm going to tell you why because it was my inside. He didn't honor the ground of that person. He honored my ground. He honored my ground. And he saw that when I gave into that bad ground, that I really, really was desiring for it to grow. I was really looking forward to that ministry increasing because I know that they what they had can benefit our people. But, but you know, God didn't honor the person the person who received it, he honored the person who gave it. And so sometimes God will have you sow into grounds that are not good um, or allow you to do that. Or maybe it's your own compassion, but whatever it is and however way you did it, God still honors it because he honors the place of your heart. He does not honor. He does not honor the place of stinginess. So, if you want it to rain down, that's how you need to sow. And it could be in anything. You got to just be a blessing to someone else. Okay. So we did 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Now, now we're going to go to, it says, how do you see someone with the spirit of poverty in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6? Right there. But this is what I say. He who sows sporadically will reap sporadically. That's a stingy of pride. That's right there. That's right there is how they sow and how they receive. That's why there's always lack. Because there's gaps. When I read this scripture, I see gaps. But when I see the next scripture, I see no gaps. I see all is fulfilled. I see this. See how nothing can come in. I can actually hold water with this, right? But in the other one, I see this. So water goes through it. I was doing a study last night on the prospering of the soul. And it shows how if your soul does not become healed, 
where you allow healing to come place, you it's like this, and you, there's a leakage. And guess what leaks out? Stanginess, anger, uh, malice, anything that's in there that has not been healed begins to leak out. And then it comes out of you. And that's what you give to people. And so, um, one second, I just have to put this in here. And so we have to be thinking about these things when we're like, why, why am I operating this way? Why do I have such a hard time giving? Why, why, what's wrong that, you know, my life doesn't seem to look like the book? Doesn't seem to look like the Bible? Why, why, uh, why is it that I'm lacking in these areas and, and I haven't had a breakthrough? There's something wrong. There's something wrong because God has done it. He has set us free from so many things. The problem is we haven't been free from ourselves. That's the problem. We're not free from ourselves. Why do I say ourselves? Because did you know that the soul is the mind, will, and emotion, but it, it is a seat. It is the seat of the mind, will, and emotion. But you know what else is called in the, de in the definition of the soul? It's called self. So we're not free from ourself. And when those things begin to operate, it hinders. It hinders the life that God has given to us. I'm going to tell you something. Um, one of the definitions of soul is the breath of God. Last night I thought that that was something interesting, and I'm going to tell you why. So I thought the breath of God was the Holy Spirit. So what God really did was when he breathed into the nostril of Adam, he gave him his soul. Then there was no need for the actual spirit of God with them because they were created in, it, it was a different era. It was a different time for Adam and Eve. They didn't have sin. So I, I'm going to say that even their skin could not have been like ours. And that's from doing a little bit of digging. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there was no flesh. There was no flesh in them. There was no sin at all. So what we have on our bodies covering us is a, a manifestation of the sinful nature. We needed thick skin. I don't think that at that time they had thick skin. I really believe that at that time, Adam and Eve was like the moment of, of the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, where they kind of could have been see-through. You know, like that moment where you, you saw them as this, but in a moment you look at them again and there's this light. And then you look at them again and it's like this light. So. That's just me from my digging and, and going in through all the way back and, and just reading and, and finding things out through definition. And I started to think like, wow, how magnificent they must have looked before they ate from the tree. God said, don't eat from the tree of good or evil because then they would have to be transformed into that knowledge so that the body can contain that knowledge. So then... They didn't listen. They ate from the tree and things changed. It changed so much that they had to leave the garden. They were casted out of the garden. They could not stay in the garden because what was in the garden was holy and sanctified. Now you're no longer holy or sanctified. You got to go. I believe that is when we totally change our skin, our, our, their bodies, everything changed because you've came into corruption. And so I'm saying this because we are, we are people that are living in fleshy vessels who are carrying a soul that you cannot see, but it's been scientifically proven that it exists. 
you're carrying a spirit in you, which is the spirit of God. For those who have accepted Christ, there is an inner man as well. And the inner man becomes new because of the Holy Spirit. It is a process. If you start digging and reading your word, you'll start to see why does the Bible say we're a new creation, but yet, yet I haven't fully received all my creativity. I have not received all that it says I should be receiving is because we must get the soul to align with the Lord. We must get our soul healed. And that that's going to take, guess what, guys? A changing of your mind. You know, repentance says that it's repentance is changing your mind about something that was incorrect, that was not of, of God thinking. It says that changing repentance is to change from the wicked way, to change from the wicked way. How do you know something's wicked if it's, it's part of your lifestyle and no one's never said it was wrong? So you just continue to do it. And then you realize that what you're doing is not working. Did you ever thought to think that maybe what you're doing is against God and the reason why it does not prosper is because of that? I don't know. But what I do know is to break the spirit of poverty, you must break your mindset. You must go against what you're thinking already. You have to align your thoughts to the word of God so that it will prosper. So today, when you come into the place of prayer, I want you to come to Father's throne this morning and I want you to align your heart with his heart in your desire to express his generosity to others, okay? Let me get my pen out. Get my pen out. So we're going to do number one. We are going to come into his presence. And we're going to align our heart with his heart. And how do you do that? Simple. Ask the Lord. Father, I need to align my heart with your heart so that I can express your generosity. Number two, praise him for causing his generosity to flow through you. So guess what? You just went in. This pen is not working. You just went in. Oh, this works. You just went in and you asked him for something. And the Bible says when you pray, you pray like it's already done. So you just went in and you asked him for something. Now you're going to praise him for receiving it as if it's already done. As if it's already done. So the second thing you're going to do is you're going to praise him. Thank him for giving the genero his generosity to flow through you. Then freely receive from his bounty. Freely receive from him this morning so that you may freely give. Guess what you're going to do? Third thing. You're going to use his promises and the faith he gave you to draw upon his riches for all your needs. Pray for the prosperity, prosperity, this is number four. Pray for the prosperity for your local church. If you don't have a local church, pray anyway. Pray for churches in general. Because right now the churches are suffering from people's stinginess. And you ain't gonna tell me, half of all these people, they got blessed. They got blessed, big time. Even those that don't, I mean, I'm telling you, even those that didn't even need to get blessed got blessed. You're not going to tell me all that money that they were blessed with in the church is dying. That don't make any sense. You know why? Because it, they're operating in an opposite spirit that is not of God. And they did whatever they wanted to do with that money. And one of the things they did not want to do was give to the church. So we got four things. You're going to come before him, spend 15 to 30 minutes with him. Just take 15 to 30 minutes, guys. That's all it takes. Go to him, align your heart, ask him to align your heart, align your heart with his so that his generosity can flow through you. And when you say that, he will provide. So I leave you guys with that because now I have 
an appointment and I ran over my time. And we're going to pray. Oh, thank you, Father. Father, we just thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you, God, for the bread of manna, the manna from heaven, God. We just thank you, Lord, for your insights. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us. Help us come into his presence. Help us to understand God's will for our life and for those around us. Take our heart and align it. Take our soul and align it with the Lord's heart that we may be able to express God's generosity to others, express God's love to others. And Lord, we just thank you. We lift up your holy name because your generosity is going to flow through us like never before. In this season, God, we're going to break off the spirit of poverty and we're going to flow in your generosity and people will be blessed for your name's sake, for your glory and your honor. And so, Lord God, we just thank you for your promises. We thank you for your faithfulness that you have given us all the riches that we are in need, God, for every need, God, you have provided. And so, Lord, we just thank you. And, Father, we just pray for the churches, God. We pray for our church, Lord, that you would flood the gates, flood the gates of our house. Flood it, Lord, because it is your house and it is your will and it is your will, your bill you will provide. And Lord, we are receiving that provision right now for the church. We're receiving that provision right now. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you for those who signs the checks, who says, I have been touched by the Father to provide for your need. We thank you, Lord. Father, it is done in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray that this is helping because I'm telling you what, guys, I am truly enjoying this session. I'm learning myself in a greater measure. And um, I couldn't ask for anything more, but for just wisdom. I love wisdom. And if you don't love wisdom, you'll never find it. But I love wisdom. I am a really a wisdom seeker. And I'm so happy to have that gift from God, the wisdom from heaven. And so, guys, when you are tuning in, make sure you keep us in your prayer as we go through things as well. Right now, we have our own situations that we're going through and we're believing and trusting God for as well. So pray for us that God's will will be done and that every door will be open that he opens. Amen. So I will see you guys again tomorrow around the same time. Thank you for tuning on. Be blessed and have a good day. It is Wednesday and you have made it through hump day. I'm not sure if that's correct to say, but if you have the right mind, I think of a camel. If you don't have the right mind and you need to get delivered. <laughs> okay, bye. Love you guys.